So about a year and a half ago, I wrote a blog called Toting the Oil. And honestly, it didn't really get read that much. And I think it's a really important story. So we're actually, since I'm starting these video blogs, or vlogs, I guess I should say, we're actually going to go take a field trip to where I got inspired to write that. You're going to think I'm crazy at first, but hang in there. There's really a story behind it and some great analogies. Okay, so we've arrived at our destination. And uh, if you'll take a look, yep, we're at the St. Augustine Lighthouse. I was actually inspired by something that the lighthouse keeper used to do that they no longer have to do. And I really see this as a great parallel for our industry and how we work with time series data in the manufacturing and heavy industries. So stick with me and I'll walk you through it. Okay, so we're looking at how they use the light in this lighthouse. And what they used to do is take a bucket of lard oil to the top, 219 stairs, multiple times a night, in one of these buckets. These buckets weighed about 20 pounds. So think about the life of the lighthouse keeper. He had to stay up all night. And think about in the summertime. Florida's pretty hot. So here he is in the pitch black. This thing didn't have air conditioning, still doesn't have air conditioning. So I can only imagine it was really hot even in the evenings. He had to walk up 219 stairs with 20 pounds of lard oil several times a night. So think about it. Isn't there a better way? And, and I believe this is what we're doing in, in how we use time series data. Let's go outside where it's not so dark and not so echoey and we'll talk about what that means. All right, so let's think about the bucket and how that applies to, uh, how are we toting the oil up the stairs in using uh, process data and time series data? Well, here's what I think. I think what happens is if you look at Pi or really any data historian to, you know, today or a legacy data historian, Pi, is, Pi does not like to call them, or OSI does not like to call themselves uh, a data historian company. It's a data infrastructure. And I actually agree with that. I think, I think they are. I think they're, they're beyond a historian. But a legacy historian company like them has a very flat tag structure, right? One sensor, one, one tag, one piece of information. So it's really difficult to understand how things are related together. So imagine this. Imagine your computer and all of your files were in the C directory. C colon backslash. Every file you had. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands on your computer were all just in C colon backslash, the root directory of C. It would be really hard to manage it, wouldn't it? So why do we do that with our process data? That makes no sense. So that's one way we tote the oil. So another way we tote the oil is if you look at how we've used that data that's in the Pi system or other historians in the past, is it was a very reactive approach most of the time. We probably had some KPIs and trends that we looked at all the time, you know, somewhat proactively. But really, if we had a major problem, it was a very reactive kind of approach. We'd go, you know, looking through process book, or we'd go back, you know, pull a bunch of data through data link and put it in an Excel sheet, you know, do some pivot charts, pivot tables, maybe write some macros, you know, maybe some of the new engineers we have, you know, they throw some stuff in Python or R or some other tool. You know, that's all great. But more than likely, we're going to build something or, you know, if we assign this to a young engineer, they're going to build something that really only they know how to deal with. So what happens is, is when that person, and, and I see this a lot, we see millennial engineers moving up the ranks really quick because we have boomers retiring. So they build these tools, we figure out, hey, they're pretty smart. They've solved these problems for us. So we promote them. Or somebody else figures out they're smart and they leave our company. Well, then we don't know really what they did. And the next person looks at what they did and like, I can't figure this out. I'll just do it myself. So we've written something that's not scalable. It, it, it solves a problem at one point in time. And we're making our lives really difficult. We're, we're using a lot of time that we could be spent, you know, much better on much more proactive kind of things. So we're going to walk across to, the, uh, to a, a, where I got inspired to write that blog last year. But... I really believe that we're toting the oil a lot still in industry. So those are ways we do it. Flat tag structure and lots of data pulling with no context to how things are related. 
So here's where the inspiration came from to write that blog. I'm not really sure why this inspired me so much, but I started thinking about what this did for the lighthouse keeper. What are we looking at? So these are block and tackle. So instead of having to carry a 20 pound bucket up the stairs, they were able to gain a mechanical advantage to get the oil up the stairs without having to walk up there in the dark, um, walk up there in the heat. So I thought, hmm, how does that parallel what we do? So I think about it, and that really to me is just the basic use of asset framework, event frames, pie analytics, pie vision, maybe even getting into some of the business intelligence tools. But really what we need is the data already organized for us in, in context. We need to get out of this flat tag structure. We need to understand how things are related. We need to understand the events that are important to us. We need to weed out the things that we don't care about. Because, hey, you know, I just did a little something for a customer where the actual flow rate didn't really matter as much as doing the hourly or the monthly or the daily average of it. And you're gonna actually see that here in a few weeks. You're gonna see how I actually use that, use Pi Analytics to just get the information that we need. That saves us time, saves us effort. We can actually tell what's going on. So that's like the second step. You know, we're gonna start getting more proactive with the data instead of everything being reactive, it's gonna be much more proactive because it's gonna tell us when, you know, something may be going wrong, something might be degrading. But I still think we have some places to go, just like this block and tackle. This wasn't where the lighthouse stopped. So when we go up, well, I, actually, I'm, it's too windy to go up, but I will do some, shoot some video up there. But you'll notice we're not using lard oil. We haven't used lard oil for years to light the lighthouse, right? So we'll talk about that technology here in just a few minutes. But that was a game-changing technology for that lighthouse keeper, and it completely changed how they work. So I'm gonna talk about how that parallels with what we're doing and what I think our version of that technology is. Okay, so yeah, it was way too windy up top there to, to shoot from up there. I really wanted to tell this story from, from up top, but what I'll do is I'll go ahead and at least give you the scene from up there. It's a, it's a beautiful view of our town, St. Augustine, so at least you can see that. I wanted you to see it while I'm talking, but oh well. The lighthouse is no longer run by lard oil. It's run by electricity. And as a matter of fact, there's two bulbs up there. There's an incandescent one and an LED one. My suspicion is the uh, incandescent one will be gone one day. Uh, it's actually the back, the LED is actually the backup to the incandescent right now. And they put the same amount of light out, less energy and much smaller is the LED. So anyway, so what's our electricity? So I think our electricity is gonna be this. It's gonna be all those tools combined that allow us to be predictive. So what does that mean? That's probably multivariate data analysis, it's machine learning, it's artificial intelligence. You kind of lump those things in a very similar bucket. So let's just call them advanced analytics for right now, just for, for, for namesake. So yeah, we're, our control room is gonna to look totally different. The operator is going to be told, here's what's about to happen, here are three actions you need to take, and it allows you to take one. Or in some cases, I think very simple cases, you know, and, and we've done this for years, obviously, with advanced process controls and neural nets, but it's actually gonna make those changes for us, the, the data systems that we use. And that's great. How do we get there? Well, I, I think one of the barriers to entry into that predictive world is some of the things that I talked about at the block and tackle and at the bucket. We've gotta get out of reactive. We've, We've got to get out of a flat tag structure. Well, asset framework allows us to understand how things are related to each other. And it gets us out of a machine-centric language. You, you don't have to have that tribal knowledge to understand what the tag name is, because typically tag names in the past have always had the instrument number or, or something referencing the PNIDs in them. So you can't always find the information easily. You have to have some tribal knowledge to understand it. So I think if we can get asset framework, we can get all the tags into English, we can get a hierarchical structure of how all of our equipment is tied together and related, it's gonna really make doing the advanced analytics actually possible. I think it's really, really difficult to do it. I've, I've done some machine learning and, and multivariate data analysis projects, um, you know, here in the last probably eight months, and it's really tough with a flat tag structure because you don't know what data you need, what data is related to what, but if you had it all in an AF structure, you say, do I need this piece of equipment? Yes, drag it over, you know, go, go pull the data out. 
So I think it's going to be much easier for us, you know, as time goes on to get predictive. And really our barrier to entry is using the tools that are available to us today to contextualize the data. One of the, I was going to tell a story. I, I actually gave a quote to a customer about a year and a half ago on beginning that journey, starting to, to move things into asset framework and event frames and start to use PyVision and maybe even some of the BI tools and, and things like that, at least get out of the reactive into the proactive world. And I'll never forget the reaction that I was told that the manager of the facility had. It was very disappointing. And they basically said, well, we've just hired a bunch of young engineers. We'll just let them go figure it out. In essence, what he said was, we're going to hire these young engineers and we're going to let them tote the oil up the stairs because that's what we did. That's how we learned. I think that's the wrong attitude. I think what we need to do is, yes, we need to let them tote some oil and see how hard we had it. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily a total bad thing. But I think... Let's use their talents to let's go ahead and start getting the asset framework built out. Let's get the event frames done. Let's get the analytics done. Because they're going to learn a lot about your process while they're having to do this. Typically, we work with a lot of the young millennial engineers to do that. They're the ones kind of coming. You know, we, we give them a task like here's, here's the things we need to know. They go ask all the, the experts that have been around the plant for 20 and 30 years. And we start building out the asset framework based on the work they're doing. So instead of them having to go build these monstrous spreadsheets and write R and Python code, we're going to give them and whoever follows them tools that they can use easily. You know, a Power BI sheet with slicers in it is not that difficult to use. I can teach lots of people how to do that. PyVision screens with multi-states on them to tell people, hey, this is out of limits right now. Not that hard to do. And, it, and it's much more time effective than it is trying to look at things and decipher what is that telling me in raw numbers or a raw spreadsheet. So let's get them working on that. And, I will, and it just it floored me that you know, they would have that attitude. And I'll never forget, I, I sent the manager that I was working with at that facility, I said, what you guys are doing is toting the oil. And I'm telling you a better way that's going to make you more sustainable. It's going to help you solve the problems you face now. But it's going, to, it's going to put those fires out, but it's going to keep them from being ignited again. Or it's going to start you down that path. Maybe we have to get to a predictive tool to fully get the thing where it won't, won't light up again. But that's what we need to start moving to. Let's get out of reactive. Get out of a flat tag structure. Get out of just looking at straight raw numbers on a process book screen and let's start giving all this new talent coming into our world the, the information that they need to be able to make smart decisions about how to run our businesses better. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. Are you still toting the oil and what is it costing you?